Well, good morning, church family. Happy post-Thanksgiving. It's good to be with you virtually, even though I'd love to be with you in person. This weekend, uh, we are going to be just gathering virtually to, um, to give everyone just a chance to rest and relax and not be together in person. We will resume next Sunday, December 6th, but uh, for this Sunday, we're going to take a little detour from, from Luke, and I want to encourage you with a few kind of Thanksgiving thoughts and um, just some things I've been meditating on that I think are going to encourage you and want you to know that I am recording from our bedroom, and this is actually my desk in my workspace at one end of our bedroom where I put together most messages, do reading, do my preparation. And so this is, um, I consider this sacred space. I consider this holy space. I consider this a spot where God and I meet and wrestle through things he wants to show me. And then things I also want to pass along to the church that I believe are important. And so it is good to be with you and I'm praying for you and uh, certainly look forward to seeing you all soon. So I have some Thanksgiving thoughts. So if you have a, a Bible, pen, paper, I want you to jot down. I have an outline today for us. It'll be fairly simple, but I uh, want you to get a paper, pen, and a Bible ready because we're going to consider Thanksgiving thoughts and meditations this morning. And I want you to know that um, Lori and I both feel like Thanksgiving is the greatest holiday. Uh, for us, it is one of those holidays that's without distractions, uh, like other holidays, have too many things kind of playing with our minds and toying with our hearts. And Thanksgiving for us is the greatest holiday because I think it's the simplest in the sense that when it all boils down to it's um, it's all about family and friends and food and who uh, who doesn't like those those three three ingredients right there family friends and food so um, but I want to I want to think about Thanksgiving more than a holiday but more of a lifestyle because here's what I truly believe I believe healthy Christians are thankful Christians I believe the 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 happiest believers in Christ are the ones who are the most grateful for not only their existence, but the life that they have in Jesus. And I think that giving thanks has become a lost art, and especially in Western societies, because I think we're so used to getting what we want when we want it, and we begin to feel entitled. And I think some of our privileges have taken the best um, of our, our joy and our gratefulness. And so I think we have forfeited our, our, our joy because we've forgotten how to be truly thankful. And nothing cripples our souls like ungratefulness. Nothing cripples our souls like when we are so prone to complain and grumble and when we're selfish and self-focused and self-centered. And so being reminded to give thanks is a very biblical idea. In the book of Psalms, we have over 50 times the psalmist tells us to give thanks. And the New Testament also reminds us about 50 times to be grateful. And so genuine thankfulness really is an act of our heart's affections. It's, it's not so much what happens with our lips, but it's where our hearts are at and it's something that should be awakened in us continually. I, I don't want it to be a, a decision I have to make. I want it to be like the reflex of my heart of understanding how much God has provided for us and how much God loves us. And so I don't want us just to set aside one Thursday a year to be thankful, but I want us to begin to learn how to give thanks repeatedly and regularly. And so four things we're going to talk about this morning. Number one is this, we need to consider the host of Thanksgiving. So usually someone is the host, right? Someone's throwing the, the party. And we need to consider the fact that the greatest host is, is God. 
who every day invites us to the feast. We need to thank God for God, like someone said. Ungratefulness does blind us to God. The more ungrateful you are, the less you will see God. Psalm 97 verse 12 says this, Be glad in the Lord, your righteous ones, and give thanks to his holy name. There's an awareness that God is, and God is the one we have to thank for our existence. Uh, Philip Yancey, one of my favorite writers, said this, It is a terrible thing to be grateful and to have no one to thank, to be awed and have no one to worship. And so for us as believers in Christ, we have a God who is good. We have a God who has shown his goodness to us. And true gra gratitude must be rooted in something that, that comes first, and namely, that's the existence of God. That's the, the, the beauty of God's character and that he exists. And, and what's, what's dangerous is Romans chapter 1, verse 21, when uh, Paul writes and talks about those who don't thank the creator for their existence, and they become darkened in their hearts, they become futile in their, uh, in their understanding, and the reason Paul says this is that you were created to give this host, God, thankfulness and gratitude. And when we don't, we grow futile in our minds and our hearts get darkened. And so the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies God. This is what Psalm 50 verse 23 says. And so God delights in nothing else but that you come to him with a joyful, rejoicing heart that says, oh Lord, you are, you are so good. Your grace is more than I could ever, ever want. And that's why the psalmist says, you will not, not delight in sacrifice, but you delight in a broken and contrite heart because God says, it is my grace that you need to be reminded of. And, and our sin breaks us, but God's grace heals us. And that's why we should be grateful. And so taste and see, Psalm 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And so Christianity does not call for some sort of vague thanksgiving to a vague deity. Our God is a triune God. As a result, thanksgiving has a Trinitarian flow to it, right? Thanksgiving flows from God the Father, through God the Son, through God the Spirit. And it's that relationship of the triune God that we get to know this host, right? The father who has sent the son, the son accomplishes salvation for us and the spirit applies that salvation and awakens us so that now we are alive in Christ. So through the spirit, because of the son, we can have a relationship with the father. So there's the host of Thanksgiving and that host is ready and waiting daily for us to just feast with him. Which brings us to point number two, the table of Thanksgiving. So we have the host God, and we should never ever forget that Thanksgiving has to do with a person, and that is God our, our creator and God our father. So now there's the table of Thanksgiving. And, and who doesn't get excited when they see the Thanksgiving table all set and laid out and you've got that special tablecloth on it and you've got that spread of food on it. And here's what you need to know, that you have a space at God's table. I am so thankful that God has reserved a seat for me. And I'm so thankful that God has reserved a seat for you at his table. See, we have to think about how wonderful it is to be at God's table. And this is where there's this marriage of both praise and thanksgiving. And the Bible needs us to, wants us to understand that praise and thanksgiving really work hand in hand. See, we praise God because praise celebrates who God is. Thanksgiving is more the focus on what, what God does. And so praise and thanksgiving work hand in hand together. And we need to understand that we are at God's table because of his grace, not just because of who he is, but because his grace has allowed us to have a place at that table. Think about this, uh, just now a few notes. Number one, you were created to sit at God's table. 
Every human being was designed by God to have a relationship with him. And so you have been created to sit at his table. The second thing we need to understand is that we rebelled and we have not appreciated God. We've become thankless. And it is the first sin to emerge in the garden where we no longer are content with what God has given to us. And so our rebellion has, has f- basically forced us to be removed from the table. Now, third thing is Jesus entered this thankless world lived being thankful himself and died in order to restore life and joy and thankfulness to our, to our hearts. And so now the fourth thing is we are not only created, but now we're redeemed to sit at God's table. We were created to do it, but our, because of our rebellion, we are no longer seated there. But because Jesus says, I want you to have a place there, we ought to be doubly thankful. There's a double thankfulness for those of us in Christ, because not only have we been created to be there, but we've now been redeemed to be there. And this is purely an act of God's grace. The fact that I was thinking about the Old Testament account of Mephibosheth, who was Nathan's son. And Nathan, before he died, asked the king that he would have a place at his table, that he would treat uh, no, Solomon's, um, not Solomon, sorry. It is, uh, it is Nathan's, not Nathan's son, but uh, his friend Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, who was crippled and himself couldn't have the best life possible. But David made a promise to his friend, Jonathan, that after he died, he would take care of his son. And so there was a place for this crippled child named Mephibosheth at the table of the king. And that is just purely an act of love and kindness and mercy and grace. And so the more you think about the fact that you don't deserve to be seated at the table, but that God has saved you a place because of his son, boy, your gratitude should grow in proportion to the value of how you understand this salvation from God. We should be most grateful for God's work in us in Christ because it unites us to the highest joy possible in God himself. So there's a survey done recently of a thousand people aged 65 to 85 and the importance of a positive attitude in dealing with life. And in 10 years after the research had been done, they followed up and found that most people described themselves uh, as optimistic, had a 55% chance of lower risk of death from all causes and a 23% lower risk of heart-related death, which means the research says optimistic people tend to be more physically active, drink less, smoke less, and they cope with stress more effectively. While one's attitude towards life is in everything, it does make a crucial difference in dealing with life. And who has more reason to be optimistic than those of us in Jesus Christ. Remembering we have a seat at God's table kindles gratitude in our souls. We are to grow in this thanksgiving. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. I love what Paul writes to the Colossian church, and this is such a great, great letter. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7 says this, Having been firmly rooted and now being built up, in Christ, establishing your faith, just as you were instructed, and you're growing with gratitude. One of the signs that you are connected with God and have your eye on that prize of the fact that you're seated at the table with him because of God's grace is that you ought to be growing in gratitude, growing in thankfulness, God meant for our lives to be response, a daily, continual response for what he has done. And so not only do we have a host uh, for Thanksgiving, not only do we have a table for Thanksgiving, but we have food for Thanksgiving. Point number three, write that down, food for Thanksgiving. Again, God's glory is the ultimate aim for our existence. And in everything we have in life is, is aimed toward that end, to glorify God. John chapter 6, Jesus says to the disciples in verse 27, Do not work for the food 
which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. The true food is not what is set before us at Thanksgiving, even though all that food that we eat is good, it's, it perishes. And it's not meant to last us forever. But there is a food that never perishes, that is aimed to, to nourish us for eternal life. And that food is everything that God has blessed us with in life. Had a, he has set the table for us, and everything that he has set the table with is good for us. Everything that the, the host has set upon the table is good and should be received with thanksgiving. Now, true, sometimes we don't like certain things that are on the table. I've heard many recently say green bean casserole is the worst thing that could be set upon the Thanksgiving table. But when we think about spiritual life and spiritual feasting with God, our Father, we need to understand that the Father sets the table perfectly. And whatever God sets upon that table is to be received with thanksgiving, even though we may not prefer it, even though we may not choose it, even though we may not like it. So the, the, uh, there's a quote I, I heard years ago, and I love it so much. This, this gentleman says it this way, the person with the discontented heart has the attitude that everything he does for God is too much and everything God does for him is too little. Ladies and gentlemen, God has done so much for us. And this is why 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says this, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So what's important about this is that when God sets the table with the food that he has deemed best for you, sometimes there's things that we love that are on the table, and sometimes there are things that we do not love that are on the table. And giving thanks in all circumstances, especially when it's difficult circumstances, especially when we're suffering, how can we be thankful with God when, when, when there's something that hurts so much in our lives? How can we be thankful in the midst of, of, of difficulties? Because it's how you perceive what God has set the table with that is either going to diminish your faith, shrink your faith, or it's going to enlarge your faith. Let me talk about this for a minute. Because if we view what comes into our lives from God that he, put, that he puts on the table, if we view what comes into our lives as punishment, something we don't like, our faith will shrivel. But if we view what comes into our lives as being from his good hand and he's put it on the table for us and we see it as redemptive, our faith will grow. See, there's the difference. Are you viewing what God has brought into your life as punishment or are you viewing what God has brought into your life as redemptive? Because I'm going to tell you right now, it's not random, and it's not by accident, and, it, and it's not just, just by chance that God has set the table for you with exactly what he believes you need. Don't view it as punishment, because that will shrivel your faith. View it as redemptive, because there's nothing that has passed from our Father's will through his hands and that he's put on the table of your life that he doesn't intend to make you more like Christ. See, we're not only to be thankful for the pleasurable things that God has brought into our lives, but we're also to be thankful for the painful gifts that God has given to us. This saint from hundreds of years ago said it this way, one act of thanksgiving when things go wrong with us is worth a thousand thanks when things are agreeable to our inclinations. So, not only thanking God when things are pleasurable, but thanking God when things are painful is just as wonderful and it's redemptive and watch your faith grow. Number four. I think I said there were four points or five points. Number four, the company of Thanksgiving. 
So not only do we have a host, God, who has invited us to the table, we have a seat, and he's provided food for us. And the food is that which comes through his word, which is imperishable. We also are there with other people. And I'm going to just stop and just tell you how much I love you and I love being with you and I love being seated at the table with you. I love the fact that we can come together and I love the fact that we can pray and sing and be in God's word together and just encourage one another. So there are those of us that are already at the table. And, and the Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that, that God leads us in Christ on this triumphal procession that leads to thanksgiving. Like the number one characteristic of our time together at the table ought to be grinning ear to ear and saying, are you kidding me? We have so much to be thankful for because there's a God who has caused us to, to be made alive in Christ. And he has now given us this victory and he leads us in this triumphal procession and we get to be there together. But the other part that we need to think about as far as company at the table is that there are those that are not yet at the table. And I'm going to tell you Thanksgiving perhaps may help those that are not at the table be at the table. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, as grace extends to more and more people, it increases thanksgiving to the glory of God. So, so the sequence, it seems to me, goes like this, that God's grace is experienced, and it's experienced as something wonderful and undeserved. And the more that we are thanksgiving, notice it's never thanksgiving, it's thanksgiving. There's this, this thanksgiving that rises in our hearts, and it overflows into the lives of others. And God is shown to be glorious, not just when things are pleasurable, but when things are painful, that awakens something in someone that's not yet at the table. When someone sees someone thankful and thanksgiving, and they're then moved to ask what makes a difference in our hearts, not only when we're thanking God in the good, but also thanking God when, it's, when, it's, when we're struggling this causes people to wonder. And so when we're attached to Christ and we're so thinking about his, his grace and his mercy, that's going to impact other people. You've never thought about perhaps how Thanksgiving can be evangelistic. Thanksgiving can be used by God to, to pierce the heart of someone who doesn't yet know Christ. And so... This is not thanksgiving, this is thanksgiving. And so let your thankfulness be evident to all. Let your grateful attitude be evident to all. Let that, that, that reflex of your heart and the, and the kindling of those emotions of, of just knowing that you've received love and grace and mercy be that which perhaps will impact others because there's more room at the Thanksgiving table. So last point, and it's this, the continuance of thanksgiving. So we have the host, God, who's invited us to the table. That's his grace, right? That he, we have a seat at the table. He's prepared food for us, and we are there with others. And there are still those that are not yet at the table. The last point is this, the continuance of thanksgiving. Nothing speaks more powerfully of a walk with God than continual thankfulness. Gratitude is designed to echo God's grace. And so the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 5, and this is such a convicting verse here in, this, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4. Paul says gratitude is to replace sins that we used to dabble in and just live in. Verse 4 of Ephesians 5, For um, there must be no filthiness and no silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Thanksgiving replaces sin in our life. And that's why the more we grow in maturity with Christ, the more thankful we become. 
And so we don't fill our stomachs and, and, and then leave our souls hungry as if this is just a once a year deal. We need to learn the practice of Thanksgiving daily. And let me, let me encourage you with your family, with your spouse, with your kids, make it a point each day to, to share with one another one thing you're thankful for. Maybe it's at the start of the day. Maybe it could be at the end of the day. But what are you thankful for? When you meet with other believers, when you come together to worship in, in church on Sundays or your small group during the week, make it a point to start your time. All right, what, what's one thing you are grateful for? What are you thankful for? See, one surprising aspect of Thanksgiving is that it's, um, it's not one big meal a year, right? If we just focus on one big meal a year, we would, we would starve 364 days. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. Back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse, four, uh, verse 20. Always give thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, the Father. And so, between 1 Thessalonians 5 and, and Ephesians chapter 5, the command is for us to be thankful always, every day, rejoicing always, because this is God's prescription for dealing with the disease of selfishness inside, self-centeredness inside, self-absorption inside. God's command for us to be thankful is a prescription of healing for the disease of what tends to cripple our souls. My prayer is that our souls would be lit on fire for the for the just stoking that gratitude for God that he wants us to, to, to have inside. That the kindling is, a, is always remembering and recognizing our need for grace and mercy and that everything that God has designed for us is found in Jesus Christ. Boy, when we're reminded of that, our, our, the, the fire grows. The kindling is that thanksgiving and that gratitude. I want to close with a, an article I read years ago, and I love this. Someone wrote this around the time of Thanksgiving, and I think it puts it in perspective. So let me just take a moment and read this, and then I'll pray and we'll, we'll wrap up our time together. Shall I thank God at this Thanksgiving? Why was I born at this particular time in the history of the world? Why was I born in a spotless delivery room in an American hospital? instead of a steaming shelter in the dank jungle of the Amazon or a mud hut in Africa? Why did I have the privilege of going to school with capable instructors while millions around the world, without a school book, sit or squat on a dirt floor, listening to a missionary? How does it happen that my children are tucked into warm beds at night? with clean white sheets while millions of babies in the world will lie in cold rooms, many in their own filth and vomit? Why can I sit down to a warm meal whenever I want to and eat too much when millions will know all of their lives the gnawing pangs of hunger? Do I deserve to share in such wealth? Why me and not other millions? Why was I born in a land I didn't build? in a prosperity that I didn't create and enjoy a freedom that I didn't establish? Why an American sitting comfortably in my own living room this Thanksgiving rather than an Indian squatting in the dark corner of some infested alley in Calcutta, shiv shivering in the cold or a Cambodian in the rubble of what used to be his home or a terrified running Nicaraguan in the jungle? Do I deserve it? By what right do I have it? And I love those words because they, they just bring everything home. We have so much. But the greatest thing that we are to never lose sight of is the eternal life and eternal hope that is ours because of Jesus Christ. Praise God.
for his indescribable gift. Praise God that he has turned our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And now we can respond back to God daily with a simple thank you. And we can live with hearts of gratitude with those around us who do not yet know Christ, who do not yet have a seat at the table. Would you make it a name? Would you make it your aim to live with a thankful gratitude, sense of gratitude each and every day? I'm praying this for you, and I hope you pray for me. Church, it's been good to be with you. I love you, and I'm thankful for you. And there's not a day that goes by that I'm not thankful for you. So thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving my family, for praying for us. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the grace that is ours through Jesus Christ. We're asking you to forgive us for the times that we have battled ungratefulness. Forgive us for the times we have forgot to express gratitude. We have forgot to say thank you. May we begin to change the trajectory of our lives and our households and our communities and become a much more thankful people. Lord, the world is here around us, and many of them don't have hope. Most don't have eternal life. May we have opportunities to express gratitude to you, and may that gratitude rub off, rub off on others so that they may know the hope that can be found in Jesus Christ. So thank you, Father, for this Thanksgiving, that it's not just a once a year holiday, but it can be a daily condition of our hearts. And that's what I'm praying for the Missio family. So thank you for this morning. Thank you for loving us and for all the riches and blessings we have in Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Thank you, church, for being together. Next week, we'll be back, Lord willing, December 6th with each other at Sozo. Until then, we love you. We're praying for you, and we'll stay connected. Godspeed, church. We love you. Bye-bye.